So I want you to imagine as you're walking throughout campus, each and every single Muslim that you meet, you say assalamu alaikum to them. Not only do they not respond, but they completely neglect your existence. You walk into the masjid, it's jam packed. Jum'ah, you say assalamu alaikum. No one recognizes you. You go home at night and you say assalamu alaikum. And even your own family shuns you away. And it's not just for one day, it's not just for two days, not just for three days, but for a whole 50 days, this is what your life is like. What would that feel like? What would be going through your head? How would you feel at that time? My dear brothers and sisters, this is the story of a real life event that happened during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. What had happened was the opening of Mecca had just happened. Monumental moment in Islamic history that the Muslims had returned to their homeland. So the ruler of the Byzantine, when he found out about this, he said, look, if we don't take care of the Muslim nation at that time, they're going to take over the Middle East and there's nothing that we can do. So let us find our allies, let us prepare, and we're going to go and fight the Muslims. And this battle that took place was the battle of Tabuk. Now what you need to know about this is that generally when the Prophet ﷺ would prepare the believers for an expedition to go out for a battle, he wouldn't give them too many details. But for the battle of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ has given them a foretelling that look, we're going to be going and fighting this huge battle. Not only is it in the middle of the desert, meaning that there's nothing else around, but you're going to be outnumbered multiple times, 10 to 1 subhanAllah. So start preparing. Now at that time, the people thought to themselves, you know what, we've been to previous battles, do we really need to go for this one? And again, the Prophet ﷺ kept inciting them. And the more the Prophet ﷺ kept inciting them, the more anxious people got and the more they got prepared. However, there were two groups of people that did not get prepared. The first group of people are those that have valid excuses. They were sick, they were elderly, they had major obligations that they could not excuse themselves from. And the second group of people, they were the hypocrites. They're the ones that were capable of going, but chose not to go. Now we introduce a third group. And the third group doesn't fall in either place. These third group of people were just a creation of their own personal circumstance. And one of the individuals, and he is the main individual in this story, his name is Ka'b ibn Malik. He said, when the Prophet ﷺ called for the battle of Tabuk, I was in the prime of my life. I was the strongest I've ever been. I was the richest I've ever been. I had multiple camels. So I could afford to take myself and many people with me. So when the Prophet ﷺ called to go for this battle, I thought to myself, you know what? There's still time. I can prepare later. And day by day goes by, but he doesn't prepare. He doesn't get any preparations done. No battle shield, no battle armor, nothing like that at all. Till the day of the departure actually comes. And he says, you know what? Inshallah tomorrow, I'll go and get ready. Then the day after, that happens as well. He's like, two days have gone by. I can still go and join the Muslims. Now at this time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He's not paying too much attention to who's there and who isn't there. In fact, Ka'b ibn Malik, he narrates himself, there are so many people participating in this battle, I could have written a whole book just listing their names. So I thought to myself, the Prophet ﷺ is not going to notice that I'm missing. He's not going to care. It's no big deal. But lo and behold, the one person the Prophet ﷺ asks about in the battle of Tabuk, where is Ka'b ibn Malik? Then one of the individuals from Banu Salama, they said that Ka'b ibn Malik has become rich. Ka'b ibn Malik doesn't need to go for battle anymore. Really like putting him down. When Mu'adh ibn Jabal who heard this and he was present, he said, be quiet. What a wretched thing to say. We've known Ka'b for ages and we don't know anything bad about him. So he put him in his place right there and then. When the Prophet Sallallahu he saw this, he remained quiet. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. 
So now some time goes by, the battle takes place, the battle is over. I'm not going to go into the details of the battle because it's not relevant to our discussion for tonight. The Muslims start making their way back and Kaab, he starts panicking. He is really panicking. He's like, I've never done a, 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 a sin like this in Islam before. What excuse am I going to give to the Prophet ﷺ? Any excuse he can possibly think of is running through his mind at that time. Now the Prophet ﷺ eventually comes back to Medina. And from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is that when he would return from a journey, the first thing he would do is go to the masjid and pray two rakahs. That was part of his sunnah. So he comes back, he goes straight to the masjid, prays two rakahs. And people start lining up in the masjid to come and give their excuses. Kaab ibn Malik, he says there were over 80 people that came to give excuses. And before this incident took place, he narrates something interesting. He said, I was walking through the streets of Medina and I was looking around who was left in Medina. Most of the men, they're gone. Who's left here in Medina? He said, I only saw those two groups of people. Either those groups of people that were accused of being hypocrites or those individuals that I saw were old and weak and feeble and they couldn't physically go. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, what a, a terrible individual I am. Now the Prophet has come back and these people are lining up and the hypocrites are giving their excuses. Ya Rasulullah, you know, there was a death in the family. Ya Rasulullah, my you know, farm was lit ablaze. Ya Rasulullah, I had a family problem. They're giving one excuse after another the Prophet Sallallahu is accepting their excuses and he's seeking forgiveness for them. He's saying, may Allah forgive you. And that was the end of their story. Kaab ibn Malik, he comes to the Messenger of Allah and from a distance, he waves to the Messenger of Allah. He says, Salaamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet Sallallahu his general nature is one of smiling, one of care. And even in this moment, he's angry but he smiles back at Kaab. He says, the Prophet smiled back at me, but the smile of an angry man. So he comes and the Prophet summons him. And he says, Kaab, come closer. So Kaab, he comes closer and he says, you know, were you not able to find transport? So the Prophet says, give him excuses off the bat. You know, take the excuse. Don't tell me the truth. Don't break my heart. That's what the Prophet is indirectly telling him. And Kaab ibn Malik, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I could have told you any lie under the sky. That's how eloquent I am in my speech. I could have told you any lie under the sky and perhaps you would have believed it. But in my heart I knew that even though you may be pleased with me now, that sometime later on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cause you to hate me due to this lie. And I would rather have you hate me now due to the truth than to love me now and hate me later due to a lie. So the Prophet ﷺ turns to his companions and he says, this man has spoken the truth. Now you have to wait. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decide your situation. So Kaab thinks, you know what? Maybe it's not that bad. How bad could it be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very forgiving, is he not? So he disperses. The same group of people, if you remember Banu Salama, the ones that were mocking Kaab ibn Malik in the battle, they went up to Kaab and they said, Ya Kaab, what is wrong with you? Why would you not just lie and get it over with? The Prophet said, he sought forgiveness for the hypocrites. Just tell a lie, he would have forgiven you and that would have been sufficient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they kept on criticizing him like that till Kaab felt inside himself that only I could go back, contradict my story and tell a lie. Because he's starting to feel that bad, subhanAllah. Now that very night, the Prophet wasallam sends out a general message. All the Muslims should know that you are not to speak to Kaab ibn Malik. So Kaab ibn Malik, he panics. He's like, what is going on? Why is this happening? Well, you know, am I the only one or is there someone else as well? So Kaab ibn Malik, he goes back to Banu Salama. As this news is just starting to spread, it hasn't reached them yet. He asked him, O oh, Banu Salama, am I the only one that told the truth? Or were there other people? And the Prophet wasallam had excused two other people as well. Hilal bin Umayyah and Murarah ibn Rabi'ah. They were the two individuals whom Allah's Messenger wasallam had said about them along with Kaab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decide 
their affair. So now every single place that Kaab is going, no one is recognizing his existence, existence subhanAllah. He walks into the masjid and says, Assalamu alaikum. No one is responding to him. He looks at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I want you to imagine as if the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is standing right there, literally staring at him like this, hoping that the Messenger of Allah will look back at him. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to force himself not to look at him. Because he was generally a very loving man. And we see this in this hadith over here. That when would he look at Kaab? As soon as Kaab radiallahu anhu would start his salah, his sunnahs or tahiyyat al-masjid or whatever it was, the Prophet sallallahu would look at him at that time. And Kaab would recognize that. So he would hurry through his prayer in hopes that he can climb, catch a glimpse of the face of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He finishes his prayer, he looks back at the Messenger of Allah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa turns away. He goes to the marketplace. He wants to buy and trade. No one is going to trade with him. He can't buy food, he can't sell food, he can't do anything. But he recognizes at that time that Hilal and Murara, they were elderly in age. So they restricted themselves and they stuck to their homes and they cried their eyes out, subhanAllah. But Kaab, he was young, he was vigorous. He still had strength in him. And he said, you know what? I'm going to get through this trial. So each and every single salah, He's heading to the masjid. He's praying with the believers. He's like almost rubbing it in their face. Assalamu alaikum. Is anyone going to respond? No one. He would come up to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say assalamu alaikum. And he would hope that the lips of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would move, but they would not move. And this is the way things continued for 40 days. And what happened on the 40th day, things got even crazier. How could things get worse than they already are, subhanAllah? The Prophet sallallahu sends a messenger to the house of Kaab. This messenger tells Kaab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you and commanded you to separate from your wife. Kaab is perplexed. He's like, what does that mean? What do you mean separate from my wife? Am I supposed to divorce her? And the messenger says, no. The messenger of Allah sallallahu just wants you separated from your wife. And he gave the wives a specific command that they're not to spend the night with their husbands. So Kaab, he tells his wife, go back to the house of your parents. Now at that time, the wife of Hilal, she comes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She says, Ya Rasulullah, Hilal participated in the Battle of Badr. He was injured severely. And on top of that, he's an old man. He can't look after himself. Please allow me just to serve him. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave her permission just to serve him. But she can't spend the night with him at all. So at that time, the advisors of Kaab, some of his extended family members that lived outside of the city, they told Kaab, they're like, Kaab, why don't you go and tell the Messenger of Allah or send a message to the Messenger of Allah that you need your wife as well. You need her to, to serve you and to take care of you. And Kaab, he thinks to himself at that time, what face will I have left with the Messenger of Allah? He's already so upset at me. Let me just see where this goes. Let me just be patient. Now I want you to think to yourself, can things get worse? Can anything possibly go wrong? And the answer is always yes. That worst moment is still to come. So now we're around the 48th day, the 49th day. He goes to visit his close friend, Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu. Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu has known Kaab since the very beginning. They accepted Islam together and they learned Islam together. They've known each other for a very long time. You can imagine your best friend, subhanAllah. He comes up to Abu Qatada and he says, Ya Abu Qatada, you've known me since we became Muslim together. Do you know me to love Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Abu Qatada is just silent. He doesn't respond. He just turns away. Kaab gets in his face again. Do you know me to love Allah and His Messenger? Abu Qatada walks away and he turns the other way. Kaab is upset and angry. How dare you deny my faith? We've been practicing Islam together for so long. We participate in every single battle. How are you going to deny my faith? And a third time he grabs him this time. Do you know me to love Allah and His Messenger? 
And this time Abu Qadada finally responds. He says, Allah and His Messenger know best. And he walks away. Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, he broke down crying at that time, subhanAllah. He thought to himself, what have I done? You know, the person that I accepted Islam with, the person that knows me best, he even doubts my own faith right now, subhanAllah. Now what happens after you hit that climax? Things need to get better. And they always do. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى That indeed with hardship comes ease. On the 50th morning, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he goes and he prays Salat al-Fajr on the top of his house, not in the masjid. And it's like one of the first times he hasn't prayed in the masjid. Because he thinks to himself, subhanAllah, you know what has happened? I can't show my face anymore and people don't even recognize my Islam anymore. No sooner does he finish Salat al-Fajr till a man climbs the mountains and he says, Ya Ka'b, abshiru, you know, receive the glad tidings. And Ka'b ibn Malik, he says, I fell down into sajda at that time, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because I knew my trial was finally coming to an end. So at that time, people, group after group, were running towards Ka'b. And the very first person that came was a horseman from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to deliver the news that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided your affair and He has forgiven you. Rejoice, you are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ka'b ibn Malik, he says, I got so excited that I wanted to give this man something for sharing this good news. But I had nothing to share with him. I looked inside my pockets, there's nothing there. So what do I do? Take my shirt. So the horseman says, the, the Messenger of Allah wants you to come and see him. So he starts thinking to himself now, I need to go to see the Messenger of Allah but I gave my shirt away. How am I going to go and see the Messenger of Allah? Knocks on the a neighbor's door and says, look, I need some clothes. Because he had no clothes because no one was trading with him. He borrows his clothes and he goes and sees the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, from a distance, I looked at the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he had gone back to his regular self. He smiled at me and his face gleamed like the moon, like it always used to do before this incident happened. And he says, Ya Kaab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed verses about you. And they were verses surah in Surah to Tawbah from 117 to 119. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا دَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَهُبَتْ وَدَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَلَّا مَلْجَا مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed these verses and He says, Then as for those three individuals that re refrained from fulfilling the command of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and once that happened, the earth became so congested upon them, they realized that there is no escape from this situation other than to run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most pardoning and the most forgiving. O oh, you who believe, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be with the truthful people. Kaab hears this and he's like, Ya Rasulullah, is this for real? Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really forgiven me? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Ya Kaab, rejoice. You know, these are the glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why is this such big news? Because very, very few people in their lifetime find out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted their repentance. Very few people find that out. He was one of those individuals. So what is his natural reaction? Again, he's so overwhelmed with joy. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm giving all of my wealth, fi sabilillah. All of my wealth, I'm giving it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet says, Kaab, you know, calm down. I know you're excited. Keep some of your wealth with you. We don't want you to go into poverty. So Kaab says, whatever I got from the battle of Khaybar, I will keep with myself. And he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah and everyone that is here, I want you to testify to the fact that I will never tell a lie ever again in my life. And Kaab, he says, since that day when I gave my word, I've never been tempted to tell a lie. I've never had the desire to tell a lie. And he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since that day has tested me many, many times. But it never, the desire just wasn't there. I didn't see a point to it. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him during that time. That is the story of Ka'b ibn Malik. Now I want to share one slight variation in another version of this hadith. So this hadith is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari in the book of Maghazi and in the book of Tawbah in Sahih Muslim. And one of the versions of this hadith, during that time when no one was speaking to him and even his wife had, you know, she had left him, at that time when Ka'b was in the marketplace, a Syrian man had come to him. He was a, a Christian Syrian man. And he says, I have a letter from you, for you from our king. So he says, what is this letter? Ka'b looks at the letter, and the letter says, from the king of Syria, from the Ghassanid, you know, tribe of people. We have heard that your people have abandoned you, and you're living a life of humiliation and disgrace. Renounce your faith and come and join us. And not only will, you, will we give you prosperity, but you will find solace with us as well. And this is what one of the versions mentions. And when you look at this, subhanAllah, this really shows you that when a person is going and trying to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repentance is not going to be easy. Repentance is going to be very difficult. Like there's going to be one test after another. In another version of this hadith, he says, when I came to see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the muhajirun were just sitting there, except for one individual, Talha bin Ubaidillah. Talha bin Ubaidillah, he got up and he came and he embraced me and he hugged me. And he narrates this in the story. Now my dear brothers and sisters, the way I would like to conclude this uh, lecture of mine is what are 10 lessons that we can learn from the story. So the first lesson we learn from the story is that wealth is definitely a distraction for people. Wealth is halal, you are allowed to earn wealth and earn it as much as you can and spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But realize you can be as righteous as a sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and it will become a distraction. Because at a crucial point in your life, you might end up making a bad decision in your life because of the fitna of wealth. Number two, in this story we learn about excuses and who are the people that give excuses. In this story, it was the hypocrites that gave excuses. The believers, they accepted the consequences and they did not lie and make excuses. In fact, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He rebukes them in the Qur'an. He tells them, لا تعتذروا, that do not give excuses because these are the characteristics of the hypocrites. So if you've done something wrong, own up to it. Deal with the consequences. Whatever happens is going to be in your best interest anyway. You may be able to deceive the people with your false excuses, but you'll never be able to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, the result of procrastination. Ka'b ibn Malik, he kept saying to himself, tomorrow I will prepare, tomorrow I will prepare, tomorrow I will prepare. Tomorrow never comes. My dear brothers and sisters, if you're not willing to take action now, you look at the consequences of it in this story, that so much time goes by that you can't make up for it anymore. Number four, learn to give excuses to your brothers and sisters and assume the best of them. We saw this from Mu'adh ibn Jabal, and we saw this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When Banu Salama were criticizing Ka'b ibn Malik, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he tells him, look, that's not what we know of him. We only know of him to be good. So keep quiet. If you don't have anything good to say, remain silent. So Mu'adh not only defended his brother, he assumed the best in him as well and gave him excuses. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as soon as he says sees Ka'b, he didn't just ask him, where were you? He said, what, did you not have transport that you, weren't able, that you weren't able to come with us? He offered that excuse. Make a way out for your brothers and sisters. Give them excuses. Number five. It was from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that when he would return from a trip, he would pray to rakas. And this is a sunnah that has become abandoned in our times. Number six. You will always have critics. You look at Banu Salama, they were pivotal in the story. In the battlefield, they're not giving any excuses. They're exposing his faults. He's gotten so rich, he doesn't need to come to the battlefield. And then even when he's come and confessed, they're telling him, you made such a bad decision. You know, why didn't you just lie? Those critics are always going to be there. And Kaab shows you a very valuable lesson. You can give in to your critics and listen to them, and your life is ruined, or you can just ignore them and move on and do the right thing. Being tested while you're repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something you need to understand. It will definitely take place. In one of the versions of the hadith, we saw that the Ghassanid emperor, he had sent this letter, 
not only will you be prosperous, but we will give you solace as well. You won't have to live a life of humiliation, degradation. Just renounce your faith. And I want you to think how tempting it was at that time, subhanAllah. The ummah has abandoned him, his wife has abandoned him, his own best friend wants nothing to do with him. How tempting it must be to give all of that up and to look for solace. But what you learn is, true happiness and true solace comes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not with anything of this dunya. Ka'b ibn Malik, he's an old man when he's narrating this story, so old that he's blind. But every single time that he would narrate this story, he cries out of happiness because he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven him. And the result of his patience, the result of his sincere repentance, Allah proclaimed and preserved in the Qur'an his repentance, and that it was accepted. Not only that, the very next ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ That all you who believe, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and be of those that are with the truthful. Who are the truthful? Ka'b ibn Malik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him from the sadiqeen. What a praise. Because he was patient during that test when he was repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number eight, the prostration of thankfulness. When the good news came to Ka'b ibn Malik, he prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thanked him. And this is such a beautiful act of ibadah that you don't need wudu, you don't need to face the qibla. If you can have wudu, you can't face the qibla. It's great. But to bow down and prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of gratitude, this is the sunnah that's forgotten. And when major good news is received, then this is what should be done. People should bow down and prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prostration. Number nine, the importance of having good character. That this is a whole story of misery, right? There's just trial after trial, pain after pain. Yet the two incidents of hope that we find in this story are Mu'adh ibn Jabal defending Ka'b ibn Malik and Talha ibn Ubaidillah when his acceptance is repented. He says, Talha ibn Ubaidillah was the only one from the Muhajirun that came and embraced me and hugged me. People do not care for your words. They care about your character. So let your true self shine through your good character because that is what you will be remembered by. Your knowledge will be of no benefit. Your writings will be of no benefit. Your lectures will be of no benefit. Anything you've done for the people will be of no benefit except for your character. Because they will always remember how you made them feel. They will always remember that. And then number 10, the act of tawbah itself. What does it actually consist of? The Prophet wasallam he says, feeling remorse and regret, that is tawbah. So you have to feel regret, you have to feel remorse for the mistakes that you've done. Number two, you have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once that remorse is there, you need to do something with it. If you're not doing anything with it, it's going to drive you crazy. That is why people go towards alcohol, they go towards promiscuity, because they don't know what to do with the pain and the regret. What you need to do with it, is find it and channel it to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is going to be by seeking His forgiveness, by doing extra good deeds, and just being patient. There are certain sins that we will commit, that the regret will stay with us forever. But you need to understand, you need to use that regret to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Tawbah is being adamant that you will never return to that mistake again. Ka'b ibn Malik, he says, by Allah, I promise to speak the truth always. He didn't lie. There was no, he, he didn't need to say that. But he wanted to show the importance of telling the truth. That when a person repents, he is adamant to make sure to never make that mistake. That he would rather be hated upon the truth than to be loved upon a lie. So you have to be adamant that you're never going to return to that state again. So my dear brothers and sisters, those are you know, 10 simple lessons that we can learn from this story. What will get you through those trials is your faith. Do not look to anything else and try to get through those trials. You will fail miserably. But have faith during those moments of trials and you will succeed. Jazakum Allah for your attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.